Uh, hello, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. My name is Margarita, and I am an archaeologist. I usually deal with textiles that are two, three thousand, four thousand years old. So this was a little bit of a new adventure for me, looking at uh, slightly later historical textiles. Uh, but what we've tried to do is to apply the same methods, the same techniques that we used to study archaeological textiles, which often we don't know who made them, where they come from, how old they are, and see if we could figure out a little bit more about textiles, um, these uh, West African textiles that are in the Wisbech collection, um, and try to get kind of a scientific angle on how we can get at their origins, at their date, and so on. So how, how do we go about that? Um, well, any textile is usually a combination of any culture's technological knowledge, uh, access to resources, different kinds of fibers, different kinds of dyes, and of course the social um, uh, ideas, aesthetics, and um, those kinds of aspects that go into production of any textile. And so by studying a textile, usually on a microscopic, but also on a macroscopic level, we can characterize uh, this, this textile um, by understanding what materials were used to make it. So it's the basic characterization, what fibers, what dyes, how was the object made? And Marika already mentioned a little bit about these different aspects of what different types of cloth there are, how they are different technologically based on how they were made on the loom. Uh, also, when was the object made? Uh, so in my case, when I deal with really old textiles, we use something called radiocarbon dating. We can't do that with more recent materials, but there are other ways to go about it. And even in some cases, we can try to figure out where uh, textile was made by um, looking at something called isotopes um, or uh, stable isotopes and strontium isotopes that are incorporated, the chemicals that are incorporated in the fibers themselves. So the actual analytical methods uh, that we apply uh, can be simple observation of the cloth, usually with um, a magnifying glass. Uh, you can see I've, I've shown you a lens. Uh, today, we also have something called a digital microscope, a little device that you can see, um, I hope here in the middle, it's, it's a tiny little gadget that enlarges a textile many times, sometimes, sometimes up to 400 times. You can see here uh, on the computer an enlarged photo, and I will show you some of them in a minute. Um, and of course, there are more complicated techniques, uh, such as scanning electron microscopy that allows you to look really close up at the fibers to identify what animal or plant they came from. And something called high-performance liquid chromatography, which is a um, chemical separation technique that's used in, pharma uh, in pharmacological research, for example, to create medicines, but also to analyze different kinds of chemicals that might be present in, um, in a substance. So this is what we use to identify the dyes, the colorants that are in textiles. Uh, so for textile analysis, um, we look at how the thread is made. Um, any thread, if you look closely at any textile you have, you can spin it or twist uh, your fibers either clockwise or counterclockwise. And um, in textile research, we call the Z or S direction because they follow the letters. It makes it much easier to describe it. Um, you can then combine these two threads into make something called a plied thread or a double thread um, and so on. There are also some threads, uh, particularly those made out of silk, that do not usually have a particular direction. They, they are what we call an eye, eye thread. And then of course, uh, we can measure the diameter of the thread to see how many threads we have in, um, in a given unit of length in a centimeter that defines the quality of a textile. The more, tech, the more threads you have in a centimeter, the finer your cloth usually is. Um, if you think um, something, you know, kitchen towel versus, um, versus bed linen, which is very, very dense. So immediately you see that difference. And then, of course, we also identify the type of weave structure that we have. And uh, Malika already mentioned the weft faced and warp faced tabby. And uh, tabbies or plain weaves is the basic, most simple kind of textile that we have made on the loom that goes back um, 10,000 years ago when people started using looms for the first time. And it's basically one over, one under. So again, think of your linen kitchen towel and, and that would be your basic tabby weave. Um, but within that, you can make quite a lot of different variations. You can uh, make it a balanced weave where you have uh, the same number of threads in warp and weft. And so it is kind of very equal. 
or you can have many more warps or many more wefts. And this is what we know as uh, weft-faced and warp-faced tabby. We also have more complex types of weaves. Uh, they're not as typical uh, for Africa, but um, we have one textile, that's why I brought it in and I'll show you in a minute. Uh, and these are called twills. Uh, and these, um, um, you can see that this, you skip over two weft uh, or warp threads in, in any go on the loom. Um, so these are um, you know, more kind of, if you think of, of Scottish production, of North English production, wool, woolens, heavy coat kind of fabric, those would have been made in twill. They're denser, they, they provide more insulation. So if we look at the textiles that we have in Clarkson's chest, we have quite a variety of these different structures. Um, so you can see here the close-ups um, at the same magnification of different kinds of weaves. We have several of the, the balanced tabbies. You can see they have more or less the same number of threads in a centimeter. Some are slightly finer, some are slightly coarser. We have several of these weft face tabbies. Um, and they again, they can be quite different in terms of how they look, how they appear. And we have warp face tabbies. Uh, we also have one textile that Malika mentioned very last, um, something called weft face tabby with supplementary uh, warps, where you have these extra warps that are floating and creating these kind of uh, checkered effect. And we have just one tiny fragment of a twill, which was a little bit unusual in the whole collection, also because it was very small. Um, and I'll come back to that at the end. Um, that, that, that there, there was a reason probably why it was um, appearing problematic. Now, when we come to identifying what the textile is made of or the fibers, the elementary units, um, they can, of course, be made of cotton or linen or wool. Um, there are many, many different types of fibers that, that could be used and are still used today. And for this, often we use microscopic methods to identify them. And uh, in my case, I like using uh, something called scanning electron microscopy, which produces images by scanning the surface with a beam of electrons. And that gives you a really, really precise idea of the surface of the fiber. Uh, and it's because the little um, irregularities on the fiber that allow you to identify what it is, that's very important. So uh, you can see a picture on the bottom of different types of fibers in the SEM. Uh, the ones that have these little scales, these are all animal fibers. So this is particular for animal fibers. The, then in the middle, you see a very, very smooth, very beautiful, um, very straight fiber of silk. And that is why when you look at silk textiles, they have this very shiny, very smooth appearance. That's because of the uh, microscopic uh, structure of the fiber. And then we have plant fibers. This is, um, in this case, flax or linen. And then the ribbon one uh, is cotton. So when we apply these known types of uh, uh, fibers to identifying something that is unknown, which is what we do, um, you start getting some information about what materials are being used in our uh, historical or archaeological textiles. So in the case of the Wisbech textiles, we have majority of textiles that are made in cotton, uh, usually white, but also sometimes colored blue. Um, we have a few five textiles that have uh, woolen elements always in the weft. Um, and we have one textile where we actually have silk. Um, we can also do something that's called wool quality analysis. And that allows us to also see if there are differences in uh, type of sheep that were being used to procure the fleece, to, pr to procure the wool, to make a textile. And so in our case, we have two groups. We have those weft face tabbies with very smooth, very beautiful woolen threads uh, that clearly were very well processed, very uniform, very aligned, and possibly they were machine spun. They were likely uh, threads that were unraveled from cloth that arrived from uh, European uh, or Asian production centers and were reused in African textiles. We also have um, much less uniform, less processed type of wool. You can see it's much more messy. Um, and this probably comes from a different area, possibly uh, more towards um, north of the production area. Uh, they also spin it in a different direction. So clearly we can start differentiating where um, our wool or our wool thread comes from by uh, looking at the microscopic level. 
And then uh, last but not least, of course, uh, it was very interesting for us to try to identify the dyes uh, that went into these colorful, beautiful textiles. And I mentioned this is a, a technique in analytical chemistry that we use for this, uh, that basically extracts the dye from, um, from the fibers, from the, from the threads. Um, and then it goes into a machine that basically creates a spectrum. And each dye uh, has various chemicals that have almost kind of like a fingerprint. So it's unique for that particular dye. Um, and then from that, by comparing to a big reference collection of known kinds of fingerprints, we can identify the biological source. It could be a plant, an animal, and, and so on. So when we look at our textiles, um, the blues were something that we expected this result because uh, there's really only one type of uh, blue dye, the source of blue dye, and that is um, indigo bearing plants. Um, in Europe, they would have been woad, uh, they still are. Um, in Africa, they likely are at this point from the actual indigo plant um, that was imported and started being grown. And indigo production is still a very, very important um, element of African textile production. So the blues uh, were not something that we um, uh, did not expect. Um, the yellows uh, were interesting because what we got here are the fingerprints, rutilin and epigenin, of um, plants that are generally speaking European rather than African because uh, there are many, many different kinds of plants that can give you yellow dyes, but uh, they are specific to geographical region. And uh, so this appears to go well with fiber analysis, which shows that this wool likely came or maybe uh, some European textiles that uh, were unraveled and reused. And possibly they were dyed as well with uh, European or Asian type of plants. But the biggest surprise uh, came from all our red, uh, beautiful red um, samples. It was known uh, already that reds were not locally produced, but all of these turned out to be dyed with Mexican cochineal, which is a tiny insect that lives on cacti. Uh, it's still produced. It was um, first used by the, the ancient Inca um, and other ancient populations of the Central and South America. And um, they started exporting this after, after European um, arrival to the, to the New World to the rest of the world. It produces very bright, very beautiful kind of dye. There are also scale insects that are known in, uh, in Asian sources, but you need many more of them than, than, than the cochineal. And so it seems that the, the red threads in our textiles were dyed with this um, substance that was clearly imported from, from the Americas. Um, so we have now really complicated network um, that we can see when we analyze the textiles. So the dyes are coming from America. Some of the threads might be produced uh, from sheep and uh, spun and possibly woven in Europe or maybe in India, maybe in Asia. Uh, and yet they all end up um, in African textiles. So when you think about, we talk about globalization today, this is already happening in the, in the late 18th century um, and all of these networks are already existent. <clears throat> 